Okay, so <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. So it's my okay. Yeah, some. So it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Lajos Haidu from University of Debrecen. So uh, he. <clears throat> so it's it's quite a pleasure for us that he's speaking in today's seminar. So he's going to speak on exponential Diophantine equations and Skolem's conjecture. And uh, at any point of time, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, stay, uh, write in the chat. So then I'll connect with Laios about these questions. I mean, so it's better that, uh, okay, after the, after the talk, open up the question and answer sessions, but before that, if you have any questions, please write in the chat. So then I will give a signal when to, I mean, uh, speak, etc. Okay, so Laios, please. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, first, I would like to, to thank uh, for this uh, possibility that I can uh, give a talk uh, at your prestigious uh, institute, uh, even online, well, in this situation, I cannot uh, do better. Uh, I'm very grateful to, to Chantal Aishram for the invitation. And of course, interrupt me anytime if you have uh, questions during my uh, talk. Yes, yeah, so I will uh, talk about exponential diophantine equations and in relation with the conjecture of uh, Scholem. Uh, first, just uh, uh, what, what will be the contents of my, of my talk. Uh, I would like to uh, give a very brief overview of the history of exponential diophantine equations. Then I would like to, to present Scholem's conjecture, also together with some support for it. Then I will uh, present a new method uh, heuristic uh, but seemingly uh, efficient method for the solution of exponential Diophantine equations. I also would like to show you some applications. And then I would like to, to show you the, the solution, the proof of uh, Skolem's conjecture in certain uh, particular cases. I should mention that uh, the, the new results I will present are joined with Attila Bircas, Chanad Berto, Florian Luca, and uh, Rob Teidemann. Okay, so first about the, uh, the main... Laios, uh, La I think uh, you have not shown your uh, that slides. I think yeah, you are showing the, uh, you don't... the black whiteboard. Yeah. You see this, the whiteboard? Uh -huh. Yeah, whiteboard, yeah, so the whiteboard, yes. No, is it better? Uh, so, are, no, are you, so, are you going to write on the, right now it's just a whiteboard. So we have to the write... whiteboard. And maybe I should stop sharing the whiteboard. Yeah. Okay. No, maybe I don't share anything. No, you can share the uh, that PDF file. Okay, this one. No, yeah, this can one. you see the slides? Yeah, yeah, now we can see it. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, I had some slides, but I, I, I just show you that I had some slides, but no. this is just, uh, what I told you so far. So I, ju I just uh, 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 listed here the contents of my talk. And I would like to start with the main object of my talk, uh, exponential Diophantine equations. So what are exponential Diophantine equations? Well, they are just, uh, of course, equations of this shape. So they are exponential uh, equations. It means that here in this equation one, uh, all the coefficients, so a1 and so on, ak, they are all fixed. All the bases are fixed. So the b's are all fixed. And also the right-hand side is fixed. What is variable? Of course, the exponents are variables. So this is an exponential Diophantine equation where we have sums of exponential terms. And the right-hand side is just some constant. Uh, for the time being, I just uh, restrict on uh, integers. So all the parameters are just uh, uh, integers. And of course, the exponents are non-negative uh, integers. So the alphas are non-negative integers. To be sure, I just show you here uh, a concrete exponential Diophantine equations. So you fixed, of course, except for the exponents. The exponents are variables. And well, uh, we would like to, to solve such an equation or or at least to say some finiteness about there are only finitely many solutions, but the best thing would be to, to be able to solve completely uh, such equations. So I shall be concerned with such exponential Diophantine equations. 
I just would like to mention that, in fact, uh, what I'm going to talk about, uh, in fact, are valid also for algebraic uh, numbers. So the basis basis could be algebraic integers, for example. Uh, but I will not go into that direction. Maybe I will, I will make some remarks, but uh, not uh, uh, not in detail. So I, I would like to stick to integer case. It is more apparent. It is it is better. It is nicer. Okay, so as I uh, promised you, I would like to give some some uh, uh, information about the background of of uh, such uh, uh, equations. So I think that they are interesting in themselves. So they are natural objects in a theory of Diophantine uh, number theory, but also they they are central in a sense that many many uh, problems just naturally lead to such equations. And I would like to to list some uh, related problems. The first thing is when we really have a a direct link when you talk about representation problems. For example, you can ask that, uh, can one generate OK? By that, I mean that the ring of integers of an algebraic number fields by sums of K units uh, additively. So uh, for example, you can ask the, the following thing. You, you just take an algebraic number field. You take the ring of integers. And then you want to, to get all algebraic integers as the sum of units. You, of course, should, uh, it's better to fix the, the number of units. So the sum of k units, you would like to get all the algebraic integers. Uh, what can you say about it? Or more generally, if you don't uh, restrict to units, but you restrict to algebraic integers of bounded norm, can you, can you do that? So there are many results in the literature about uh, such uh, questions where in general you can say that no. So for any k, it is not possible. Uh, yeah, I don't read the, the names. Uh, there are really many papers in the literature about this, this problem. A related problem is that other representation problem, you would like to get all the primes as a k term sums of elements with fixed prime divisors. So can you do that? Uh, you just, you just, uh, give a finite set of primes, say two, three, five, seven, and then you would like to get all the primes uh, as k-term sums of elements having only prime divisors two, three, five, seven. Can you do that? Again, no. So they are really uh, questions which immediately lead to uh, lead to exponential Lyapuntine equations. Yes, I should mention that in the first case, of course, you should use Dirichlet theorem. Uh, that, that uh, tells you that the, the unit group of an algebraic number field is finitely generated. So that's why you can really directly get, can get uh, exponential uh, Diophantine equations. Or another set of problems is lower bounds for the largest prime factors of products. So you take a product, of course, in a tricky way. So you take sums of uh, elements uh, of a set A in of integers, and then you take this product and then you want uh, that this product uh, is composed only of small primes. Is it possible that all the prime divisors of this product is small? And you would like to have a large A and this only small prime factors. Well, it is not really possible. You can give uh, a lower bound for the largest prime factor. It cannot be too small. Similar questions if you have two sets and sums from two sets, or you have AB plus one such terms in your product. A and B are from uh, sets. And then you see, uh, again, many results due to Erdős, Turán, Győri, Stuart, Edemann, and there are also other uh, related uh, results. Uh, another, uh, yeah, of course, again, so if uh, this product is uh, just uh, composed of small primes, then it immediately means that every factor is composed of small primes. And then you just get uh, an exponential Diophantine equation immediately the, with a very little work. Uh, you can also uh, think of arithmetic graphs, another set of problem. So uh, let A be a finite subset of integers. And uh, uh, you, you consider the elements of the set A to be the vertices of your graph. And then uh, you do the following. You fix a finite set of primes, capital S. And then you connect two elements in, uh, in your graph, two, two vertices, if all prime divisors of the difference belong to this set. And then you can ask about uh, 
the properties of such graphs. There is, again, quite a huge uh, literature on such graphs, uh, and they have important applications, for example, for decomposable form equations. Uh, so uh, you, can, uh, you can use the theory of exponential diophantine equations here again. And then uh, I also would like to mention uh, recurrent sequences, recurrent sequences, because they form a very important uh, topic uh, in the theory of Diophantine equations, Diophantine number theory, with many important uh, problems and applications. So, for example, you can ask about the T multiplicity of recurrent sequences, which means that how many times a linear recurrent sequence can take a value T. Uh, and then, if you uh, know the, the theory of recurrent sequences, at least in, in the simple case, when all the roots of the characteristic polynomial is simple, you get such an equation, an exponential Diophantine equation, the variable is n, and then you would like to solve this equation, you would like to get some finiteness. So this question, again, leads to an exponential Diophantine equation, and then you can um, recall results of uh, Skoll and Mahler, like very important and fundamental results or famous results of Schmidt, Schlickerweil, or Brinza, Pinter, so many related results. But at this point, I also would like to mention that, of course, uh, recurrent sequences are really uh, a central object in uh, Diophantine number theory with very many uh, important questions, problems about them. Uh, for example, power values or factorial values or, or really many things. And uh, uh, in the literature, you can find uh, important nice results, among others, to Bij uh, due to Bijot, Mignot, Sixek, Leishram, Lukas, Shori, and many others. So this is really a very important uh, object, very important topic here, and again leads to ultimately leads to exponential Diophantine equations. So now I hope that you are uh, convinced that exponential Diophantine equations are not only very nice, but also uh, very important in the sense that they they have many applications. They are related to several things in uh, Diophantine number theory. Okay, so then what can we say about uh, such, uh, uh, such equations? Can we solve them? Uh, can we bound the number of solutions? What can we say about that? And well, so the, the theory is, uh, has very many important and interesting parts, but it is not developed enough in some sense. So there are still many, many very important open questions. So uh, when we consider the situation of two terms, so k equals two, here you can see, I don't know how to underline it, so I hope that you, you see that this moving hand. So if you look at this equation, so this is our exponential Diophantine equation now, because we have only two terms. So the sum of two exponential terms equals the constant. So in that case, uh, we can uh, say many, uh, many things uh, about the solutions. Uh, in fact, we can bound eff uh, effectively, explicitly uh, the, the unknown. So the, the unknown exponents can be effectively, explicitly uh, bounded. Uh, you can see results of Dury or Shori and Tiedemann or really many, many more. But this is only for two terms. So this is only when you have two terms. Uh, if you have more terms, then this doesn't work. Uh, more precisely, if you have three or four terms on the left-hand side, then under certain rather restrictive uh, further conditions, you can still achieve some kind of effective bounds for the number of, uh, uh, for, for the solutions themselves, but not in general. So for k equals two, you can get upper bounds for the exponents. And then of course, we have a, a method, uh, a principal method, which I will a little bit outline, uh, but not for uh, more terms. So how can you solve a concrete equation that also can be interesting that, okay, so can we solve such an equation? Suppose we have two terms. Well, that answer is practically yes, but it has some interesting features. In the first place, uh, you give a bound for the maximum of the exponents by Baker's method. So this is uh, well known from the literature, many nice results in that direction. You can do that. But typically the bounds are rather large. So it is, uh, a principal algorithm that you just check out all the possibilities. Yes, in principle, it is nice. In practice, it doesn't work. So what you can do is that you reduce the bound what you got uh, with tools from Diophantine uh, approximation, for example, by the LL algorithm or baker davenport lemma. But this step is heuristic. So you are not sure in advance that this will work, but 
it always works. So at least uh, so far, whoever, whenever tried, this uh, reduction always works. And there's a very nice heuristic argument that why this should work all the time. Okay, but uh, uh, I don't want to talk about that. By this reduction method, you can reduce the original upper bound uh, quite low, and then you can really list all the solutions below that small bound, what you, what you got. Okay, so this is, so it means that there's a kind of heuristic, but a very efficient method for the solution of such equations when uh, K is uh, equal to two, we have two terms. Okay, but what can we say about the arbitrary situation? We have K terms, arbitrarily many terms. What can we uh, say then? Well, uh, in that case, the situation is much more difficult and we know only a finiteness result for the number of solutions. So we, we cannot bound the solutions. We can only say that there are only finitely many solutions and we can give a bound for the number of solutions. But not all solutions in general, we have to be careful. We can give uh, such a bound for the number of non-degenerate, so-called non-degenerate solutions. That is solutions with no vanishing subsums, which, which are not related to vanishing subsums. What do I mean? Very simple and trivial situation. You can consider this equation in the middle of my slide. Uh, of course, I, I put it in a shape which is different from the previous ones, but in this way, you can really see what is going on. Of course, you could expand it to, to have really a, a usual shape of exponential Diophantine equations. Okay, so if you expand this product, then you get an exponential Diophantine equation. But the point is that you see that this part is always zero, of course. Whatever alpha, beta, and gamma are, this is zero. So you take delta to be one, and alpha, beta, gamma arbitrary, you have infinitely many solutions. Of course, you cannot bound the number of solutions. Yes, but this is a degenerate situation. So you have some, some degeneracy. And if you say that, okay, I don't want to handle with degenerate uh, situations. Yeah, very good. In that case, uh, you can really bound the number of solutions. Number of non-degenerate solutions you can always bound. Uh, you can find uh, many results in the literature about that. But once again, you can only bound the number of solutions, not the solutions themselves, even if you talk about non-degenerate solutions. Okay, but what to do if you still would like to solve such, some Diophantine equation? You deal with uh, an important uh, problem in, in Diophantine number theory, and you are led to some concrete exponential Diophantine equation, and you would like to solve it because it would be very important for your application. What can you do then? Well, it's not an easy problem, of course, but uh, you, can, uh, you can turn to Skolem's conjecture. Uh, what does it say? So now I will talk about Skolem's conjecture and related uh, things. So Skolem's conjecture, roughly, roughly uh, speaking, uh, says the following. It says that if an exponential equation has no solutions, then it has no solutions modulo m with some m. So in fact, this formulates a well-known kind of local global principle. So if there are no uh, Global solutions, then there are there shouldn't be local solutions for some uh, m modulo m. So roughly speaking, this is the conjecture. I will be more precise because this conjecture has many variants. For example, for algebraic uh, parameters with zero or non-zero term on the right hand side. So many many. Uh, you should be more precise, of course. It's more a principle than a conjecture at this stage. Lyos. Uh, 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 just yes. one, there's one question from uh, yes. Ajit. Uh, there's one question. Maybe Ajit Balji, you can ask your questions to him. Uh, I think there's yes. one question. Uh, in this page nine equation, the first two variables uh, can be many values, but delta will be fixed. Oh, on the slide uh, number nine. On the page nine. The previous one. The previous. One. Yes. Yes. Previous one. Yeah. Here, here you mean? Yeah, so uh, that means uh, delta will be unique, but others alpha, beta can have many values. Is that what you mean? Yes. Okay, yes, thank yes, you. Yes. Thank you. Yes, 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 yes. So together the, the equation, uh, the, sorry, the, the solution quadruple alpha, beta, gamma, delta, there will be infinitely many. Uh, delta is fixed, but alpha, beta, gamma is arbitrary. So if you talk about the sol solution uh, quadruple alpha, beta, gamma, delta, there will be infinitely many solutions. Yeah, so this is what I mean. Okay, so uh, Skolem's conjecture 
here I just uh, formulate a concrete variant of, of the conjecture. So I just record here the general equation. So this is the, the object of my talk, exponential Diophantine equation uh, with non-zero uh, uh, integers, the A's and B's, they are fixed. C is also fixed non-zero. And then the exponents are unknown, uh, non-negative integers. Okay, and then the conjecture is the following, just what I told you, but now really precisely. Suppose that this equation one, well, it is not number, but this is my equation one. Uh, suppose that equation one has no solutions, then there exists an integer m, at least two, such that this congruence has no solutions in non-negative integers, well, in, a, in the exponents. So this is a rather hard uh, conjecture. It is not, it is very far from being proved, but I will show you some, some support uh, for that this conjecture really may be true or might be true. Well, it depends on your taste, of course. Uh, so first I would like to, to show you a, a CRM due to uh, Chanar Bertok and myself, uh, which shows that this conjecture is in some sense almost always valid. So we could prove the following. Uh, suppose that the A's and B's are really fixed. And let H be the set of the right-hand side C for which the conjecture is false. The conjecture is violated. So once again, C is just the set of those non-zero integers for which equation one is not solvable, but equation two is solvable for all M. So uh, you, you check that for, for what right-hand sides uh, your, your, your conjecture fails, Scholem's conjecture fails. And then it turns out that this set has zero density. So uh, this set has zero density, not only inside the, the largest possible set of integers, but even inside uh, a much smaller set, uh, even inside the set uh, of those right-hand side, which are non-zero integers, for which equation one is not solvable. So even in that smaller set, it has zero density. So this, this uh, says that Skolem's conjecture, if you fix the left-hand side, the parameters are fixed on the left-hand side, the Skolem's conjecture is valid for almost all C on the right-hand side. Okay. And this is valid also in the, in the algebraic situation, but I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, just one or two uh, sentences about the proof of this CRM. Well, in the, in the background, you will find a very important, very nice result of Erdős Pomeranz and Schmutz about uh, Carmichael's lambda function. So the point is, yeah, and well, no, I will not. I, 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 this was the point when I, I uh, planned to, to make some sketches, but I will not do that. I tried to uh, summarize it in, in words. So the point is that, that uh, you use uh, Carmichael's lambda function. What is that? The point is that, that uh, you go for the, the order of the elements modulo m. So you do the following. You just take a modulus m, and you are interested in the orders of the, of the integers modulo m. Of course, at least at the first step, you should restrict to integers which are co-prime to m. You just look at the orders of the integers, such integers modulo m, and okay. Uh, so Carmichael's lambda function just describes the maximum of these orders. And it turns out that this order, this maximal order can be very small for an infinite sequence of moduli. So you can find an infinite sequence of moduli such that this maximal order of elements is very small, very small with respect to m. And it means that we're well, roughly speaking, maybe I turn one uh, uh, page back, that you can find moduli M such that the left-hand side is very, very small set modulo M because the moduli of the Bs will be small. The left-hand side is altogether small. So you have uh, a large M, a very large, well, set modulo M, the integers modulo M, a large set. And the left-hand side is only a very tiny little portion of, of uh, that set modulo M. And then the, the heuristic says, and also the proof uh, in, in, the, in this, the previous theorem is that, okay, this, this tiny set 
uh, well, will not hit too many integers on the right hand side. Yeah, and uh, the heuristic is that it shouldn't hit, shouldn't take an integer value just only because of some good reason. And the good reason is that there is really a global solution behind that. The point is that you have infinitely many such m, you can really play with the moduli and for each m you should have a solution. So this is the heuristic uh, uh, which is behind the principle. And this is also behind the proof and that it is not a heuristic, it is just almost all. So you can really make it precise in that uh, formulation. Okay, so this was the, the point I wanted to emphasize here. And we also have, so this was the theoretical, well, kind of evidence or, or support, better to say support for the conjecture in general. And I also would like to mention that there are uh, several cases, concrete cases where the, the, the conjecture is tested and it is still alive. So for example, uh, results of Dimitrov and Hover from 2011, they just could solve by this principle these equations, they are particular equations and not too many terms, but still they could solve all these equations for certain right-hand sides. Uh, so they, they, they could more precisely at this stage, I should say that they could prove the insolvability of such equations for appropriate right-hand side. And uh, together with John Albertov, we made a systematic study and we just checked the, the uh, validity of the conjecture in many cases. And you see, we took many terms, uh, we took, uh, uh, a few terms, but with large, relatively large values of the constant, or we also went for the algebraic situation. So we really tried to, to uh, check numerically a large domain as large as we could. For example, just a striking example, uh, we just consider this particular equation. It is not very interesting. It is just for fun or just for check the, the conjecture. So we just consider this and then we could uh, we could prove that this equation has no solutions uh, modulo m with an arbitrary m, and of course, then it has no solutions among the integers. You can ask that, okay, what is the right-hand side? What is this strange number here? Well, this is interesting. If you replace this with any positive uh, integer, which is smaller than that number, there is a solution. This is the smallest positive integer for which this equation has no solution, and we could prove it locally with the with the principle with the conjecture. Okay, and I just would like to make a few remarks here. Uh, one remark is that uh, this modulus always worked for the cases we considered. I just show you this because I can point out that, that the trick behind the proof of Erdős, Pomerans and Schmutz and, and all the developments later is that you can uh, take primes such that P minus one is a product of only small primes. So you take such primes, P minus one is just a product of two, three and fives in this case. Uh, P can be relatively large. You take this product, okay, some small uh, constant in the in front, and this modulus will, will do. So such such products uh, has the property that that the Carmichael lambda value is very small, and then you can hope that that yeah. you can solve your equation. Yeah, please. Uh, is there a question? Uh, the, the previous slide. Sorry, I don't understand completely. So the, the point here is that, of course, that there can be other moduli, of course. So this is just an appropriate modulus. Uh, and, and the point is this, P minus one is just product of two, three and five, powers of two, three and five. And you take the product of these primes. This is the point. So this is a good modulus for Karmarker's lambda function. And it is a good, good modulus for the equation. This is the main point. Well, just some technical remarks here. We implemented the algorithm, but we are not completely satisfied yet. Okay, I will talk about the, the implementation, not the implementation. I, I will talk about the method a little bit uh, later in, in details to some extent. Okay, and then uh, uh, using uh, this approach, uh, one can really, really solve uh, some uh, Diophantine equations, exponential Diophantine equations completely. I would like to also talk about that, that might be interesting. But before that, I would like to say that in the literature, you can, you can find uh, some, well, scattered results. So some, there are some results where some, some particular equations uh, could be handled. 
even with baker's method in some cases, but then you really have to make some restriction. So I already made some remark into this direction. So in some cases, if you put some restriction, even baker's method can be applicable. Or you can find some, you can follow this method and you can, you can solve your, your equation completely. But there are not really many uh, things in that direction uh, previously. So together with uh, Chana Bertok, we worked out an application scheme. So how can you, how can you apply uh, this conjecture to solve actually uh, Diophantine equations? So the point is that, that uh, the Scholem's conjecture says that if there are no solutions to the equation, then you can find the modulus such that there are no solutions modulo M. Okay, believe it or not, okay. But what if there are solutions to your equation? Then you cannot apply Scholem's conjecture directly so then what to do? If there are equations uh, globally, then you cannot say locally that there are no solutions or whatever, what can you do? So we worked out an application scheme to, to handle this difficulty. Uh, so suppose that equation one has only finitely many solutions, they exclude the situations with, with vanishing subsums. Then uh, the first thing is that you just make some deep search and then you get, get a list of uh, suspected solutions, let's say, uh, that, uh, in fact, uh, you can be kind of sure that you found all solutions. The point is that you cannot show that they are really all solutions. I will show you an example and then it will be clear what I'm doing uh, here. So then you choose uh, one of the unknowns, one of the exponents, say, and then uh, the based upon your uh, suspected list of solutions, you just choose an integer, which is greater than this exponent, then you know that there shouldn't be solution with the exponent value being alpha zero. So you replace your coefficient AI by this shift, you just shift this uh, power of the appropriate uh, basis to that constant. And then now you suspect that the new equation you, uh, you constructed has no solutions at all. And then it means that you can use the principle, you can try to find the modulus M such that this new equation has no solutions, modulo M indeed at all. I'll show you an example and then it will be much more uh, apparent what I'm doing. So consider this very simple equation, uh, three power alpha equals two power beta plus five power gamma in non-negative integers, alpha, beta, and gamma. Okay, then you just make an exhaustive search in this domain and then you find these solutions. You see, I went up to 100 and then uh, we found these solutions. So you can really think that, well, then there are no more. I'm sure there are no more. These are all solutions, I'm sure. Okay, but I should prove it, how? Yeah, anyway, of course, they really come, these, these triples come from certain solutions, of course. So then what you say that, okay, I look at these solutions. The largest value for alpha is three. It means that there is no solution with uh, power four uh, in three. So if I make this shift, I write three power four times three power alpha prime on the left-hand side, then this equation has no solutions. This is what I suspect. I suspect that this equation has no solutions anymore. And if I believe in Skolev's conjecture, then I say that, hey, I can prove it modulo M if I, if I am lucky. I can find an M such that this equation has no solutions modulo M at all. And indeed, this, this, uh, this is the case. Of course, you can very easily check that this modulus just works. Okay, I know that I'm unfair. Yeah, sorry, I apologize. So you can use, if you factorize them, then it will be much more clear that what is happening. Of course, this is just a disaster to look at this M, sorry. But if you factorize your M, this is your M. And if you check out what the primes, they are all primes here, uh, seven, minus one is six, only twos and threes, I don't know. Uh, 30, uh, seven minus one is six, uh, 36, only twos and threes, you see? So you really find such moduli here, such primes, such that P minus one is composed of, I believe only twos and threes uh, in this case. So this is a very nice modulus for the Karmarkes lambda function. The Karmarkes lambda function for this M will be so tiny. Uh, meanwhile, phi of M Euler's phi is this huge. So this means that you really have a good chance that, that uh, modulo M only the global solutions will appear. And this is really the case. 
and there are no global solutions, and that is what you will get modulo m. This equation has no solutions modulo m for this m. So the principle. Of, uh, okay, and then I would like to to uh, tell you, but I don't want to go into details here because um, uh, I don't want to. Uh, so uh, time time is flying. So with the uh, Chana Bertok, we really could apply this principle to many types of uh, equations that this really works. So we could really get all solutions. I just uh, mentioned here that we went for so-called balancing numbers, which form a certain uh, interesting uh, Lucas sequence, uh, a binary uh, recurrence, linear recurrence sequence, and also we could handle a problem there. So this principle really worked for, for many applications, other applications. So really, really there are uh, several other applications concerning Fibonacci and Lucas numbers, for example. So there are really many, many uh, applications which we could uh, handle. In some cases, uh, we could solve with this method uh, problems, which, which couldn't be solved with, with other methods. So other, other colleagues tried to solve it with Baker's method differently, and they, they couldn't do that. And this method just worked. But I don't want to go into details, because then, then uh, I will just uh, run over time. I don't want to do that. So I just tell that really, for many types of uh, exponential diophantine equations, this method can really be applied, and we could solve several such uh, problems. OK, so uh, this was about, uh, say, the, the practical uh, part of, of uh, Skolem's conjecture, how you can use it for diophantine equations, sorry, exponential diophantine equations. And now I would like to talk a little about uh, uh, the Skolem's conjecture from the theoretical point of view. I mean that, uh, can we prove it? Uh, how, how, but which, which stage we are at the moment? So what do we know about the, the proof of uh, Skolem's conjecture? Well, not much, not much. There are some interesting things I can tell you, but you will see that there is a very large room for improvements. Okay, so I would like to start with uh, a result of Schintzel, uh, which just concerns the one term case. So we have only one exponential term on the left-hand side, and this product equals C. Uh, well, it is not, uh, not uh, completely trivial, but still, this is really a starting point. Uh, Schintz uh, proved the, the conjecture in that case also for the algebraic situation. So really, uh, in the most general case, I would say uh, uh, it was handled. But this is only for one term. So it's really the starting point. And I should mention that recently, Bartolome, Bilu, and Luca uh, proved the conjecture uh, for this uh, situation, well, you see here L terms, so say arbitrary number of terms, but uh, here, where well, you have only one exponential expression, and more importantly, it is restrictive in the sense that uh, they had to assume, well, it was in the algebraic case, that uh, the multiplicative group generated by B1, BL is only one, the rank, I mean, sorry, the rank of this group is only one. So they are composed of only, say, one prime. Uh, and in that sense, it is really rather special. It is rather similar in some sense to, to uh, Schinzer, Schinzer's uh, result. In fact, it can be proved by Schinzer's result in a non-trivial way. And this is still a nice, uh, nice result. I just only would like to say that it is still far from being, being general. So this is really this restriction that the multiplicative group uh, has only rank one. Well, it is really uh, shows that there are a lot of lot of cases uh, which should be should be done. So th this is also just kind of first step, so to say. Very important, very nice, but still just the beginning. Uh, recently, we could uh, update. So I would like to show you some new results. Uh, they are still restrictive, of course, or well, not of course, but you will see. Uh, we obtained them uh, with uh, Beetzesh and Teidemann, uh, the first CRM. And uh, what is this about? Well, uh, this says I just start at the beginning. So consider uh, at the end, sorry, of the statement. So consider this state, this uh, equation. We have two terms. So not one term, two terms. OK, it is more than one, but uh, much less than k, even k is w. So consider this equation. The right hand side is only plus minus one. This is only allowed. So consider this equation. And where, roughly speaking, uh, Skolem's conjecture is true for this uh, equation. This is what we could prove. More precisely, we can find the modulus 
such that all solutions of this congruence are the same as the solutions to this equation. In particular, if it, this equation has no solutions, then the congruence has also no solutions. We can find such an M. In fact, we can construct such an M. If you fix your parameters X and B and the Y's, then we can construct such an, such an M. Uh, yeah, I should mention that this is a, there was an earlier result due to Tiedemann and myself when there were some special uh, choices of, of the parameters. So we could extend this to, to this uh, uh, situation. Okay, so here I would like to talk briefly about the proof I, uh, of, of this uh, theorem. Yeah, so once again, uh, Schoolham's conjecture is true in this uh, equation. In the more general sense that we can find the modulus such that all solutions of the congruence are the same as the solutions of the equation, even if there are uh, there are really solutions, not, not only in the case when there are no solutions. Okay, I already mentioned that, uh, that uh, uh, the modulus sum can be explicitly constructed. Well, uh, the theorem three covers famous equations of, uh, so these two equations, Catalan's equation and this other well-known equation for fixed moduli. So here we always assume that the, the bases are fixed. Uh, yes, and, uh, and for example, for the Catalan equation itself, you can formulate some such kind of uh, some kind of uh, co consequence, but I will not explain it. I will explain this phenomenon later through another example if we we'll have time for that. I hope. Okay. So, uh, how to prove this this theorem? What are the main steps? The main main points. So uh, we have this uh, congruence. And this is the equation we are uh, talking about. Of course, if, uh, uh, if uh, we have a solution to this equation and K1, KL are solutions to this equation, of course, they will be there modulo M for every M. So clearly all solutions of the equations are solutions of the, of the congruence, of course. So this means that it is sufficient to find a certain M such that all solutions of three are also solutions uh, of four. So in one direction, it is situation is clear, the other direction is interesting. So to find the modulus M such that the solutions modulo M are also global solutions. Okay, so let S infinity be the set of solutions for equation four and SM be the set of solutions for equation three. By this notation, I only said that S infinity is a subset of SM for any modulus m. Okay, and then it's good to make a good uh, or, or, or some uh, observations. And the first thing is uh, that if uh, m1 and m2 are divis divisors of m, then of course s of m, the solutions modulo m, will be contained in the solutions modulo m1 because it's more restrictive to consider the congruence with m in that case. And also this is a subset of uh, the solutions modulo M2. So it is a subset of the intersection. So this means that in fact, you can do the following. You can find this thing moduli, and then you consider the solution sets. And if the intersection of the solution sets is just the set of global solutions, then you are done. Because then you will just take your moduli to be the product of these small moduli. So the, the, the point here is that you can you can intersect the information. You can combine the information obtained, obtained for different moduli. It is a trivial observation, but very important observation. It makes life much more easy in the, in the argument. Okay, uh, if just another uh, remark here this is about that, that if you assume that you are in a finite situation, if you assume that your, your parameters are fixed, I mean, if you, if you assume, for example, just uh, here I can come. If you, for example, assume that n is fixed, x to the n is fixed, then you are kind of in the one term situation and then you are just done. So if you can fix one of your terms, then you are immediately done. So if you can make the situation finite in some sense, then you are just immediately done. Okay, and then uh, we shall need in the proof, the theory of S unit equations, what I, I mentioned in the introduction, uh, we used a theorem due to Everts and Dury in a very special, very simple case, we have only a difference of S units, difference of exponential terms equals C. So if you have such an equation, 
such that V1 and V2, they are integers such that we know that all the prime divisors of V1 and V2 belongs to a, a fixed finite set. And uh, C is just a fixed non-zero integer that this equation has only finitely many solutions. And uh, the number of solutions can be effectively bounded. In fact, not only the number of solutions, but also the solutions themselves, but it is sufficient to know that the number of solutions is finite and we can bound that. So we shall use. Okay, and then the argument. So how the argument rolls? Uh, well, I will just uh, present the argument in a simple situation. So only for this equation, x to the n minus b times y to the k equals one. So I only take one term here, not product of air terms, at only one at the right-hand side. Well, plus one or, one or minus one, it's not a big difference. So the, the argument is similar for minus one. And if you have more terms, then it's really, uh, you can handle the situation by, by induction. Uh, so it's really, this is the bottleneck. This is the, this is the important, uh, well, equation to handle. Okay, so, uh, well, again, just some finite cases, if, or just simple cases. If, if the GCD is not one, or, or if X is one, or Y is one, then thing or zero, then everything becomes finite and trivial. So just really go for the, the general solution, X, general case, X and Y are co-prime. Uh, and uh, uh, consider that case, a non-zero and greater than one in absolute value. So consider this equation this is an S unit equation because X and B and Y are fixed. So the prime divisors of X to the N and B times Y to the K are fixed. So you are in an S unit equation situation. We know that there are finitely many solutions. Let, write capital N for the number of solutions. And then you can do the following uh, thing. Uh, let S1 be uh, the smallest integer such that Y power S1 is greater than X plus one, X in absolute value. Y and X are fixed. Well, it's trivial how to find this S1. You could uh, find it explicitly. Okay, so S1 is just some integer you can find in terms of X and Y. If K, so if this exponent K, is smaller than this fixed S1, then you are in a finite situation and everything is trivial. So assume that K is greater than or equal to S1. But then it means that if you consider, I just again scroll back, uh, sorry, where do I want to go? Uh, oops, I want to come here. So oh, not, not here, this was just more general, here, here. So uh, if uh, K is larger than this S1, then it means that modulo uh, b times y power s1, this is zero. So you have x to the n is congruent to one modulo y power s1. But this means that n is divisible by the order of x modulo this modulus. Write O1 for this order. And then we know that it cannot be one. We know that O1 is between two and y power s1. And then you take s2 to be greater than this uh, expression, x power o, one plus one. And then you just repeat your procedure. Uh, you may assume that k is at least S2, otherwise you're in a finite situation. So you consider your equation modulo y power S2, and then you get again that x to the n is congruent to one and is divisible by O2, which is the order of x modulo this larger modulus. But this also means that O1 divides O2, uh, you have this, uh, well, assertion, and then you can just continue. You just, co just continue this. Ultimately, you make capital N steps. Capital N is the number of solutions of that uh, S unit equation I, I mentioned. So you just repeat it uh, with N steps. If anywhere you ju are just stuck, it means that you are immediately in a finite situation and things are easy. What if you can really make your N steps? Well, then you will get a contradiction. And why? Because these, uh, these orders are divide each other, they also divide M. And it means that if you consider your equation just in the title, modulo X power O1, OI minus one for these values of I, then you get this congruence because OI divides M. So you get this congruence. But this means that uh, this expression, this X power OI minus one is an S unit, is only divisible by primes of B and Y, but so then they are all S units, but then you will just get too many solutions for your S unit equation. And this is a contradiction. So you just 
uh, collect together all the all the primes uh, appearing uh, in the in the argument, or not primes, all the moduli appearing in the argument. You make the product of them, and then you are just done. So this is the argument, roughly uh, speaking. And uh, finally, I just would like to mention a similar uh, theorem, just uh, without any proof or whatever, concerning uh, the situation of Fermat's equation. So here, this is the equation you are looking at, a Turner equation, uh, powers are n. And then, uh, uh, so roughly speaking, we could prove with Florian Luca and Robert Teidemann that uh, Schoenheim's conjecture is valid for this Turner equation as well. Uh, namely, all solutions of this equation can be obtained modulo m with an appropriate m. You can always find such an m. Where the proof is similar to the previous proof, uh, I, I mean, but here I don't want to talk about the proof, but I would like to mention interesting corollary. So the corollary is the following. If you really think of Fermat's equation, what can you, what can you say? So let A, B, C be positive integers, which are a co-prime. Then our theorem implies the following. There always exists a modulus M such that this congruence, A to the N plus B to the N congruent to C to the N modulo M has no solutions in non-negative integers N with N at least three. Uh, even we can uh, explicitly give such a modulus M in terms of A, B, and C. So here I should make a very important remark. Well, the, the, the first remark is that this implies Fermat's last theorem. But you shouldn't think that we were able to give an elementary proof for Fermat's last theorem. No, no, no. The trick is that to prove this corollary, we need uh, this theorem. And in this theorem, uh, we only can prove that uh, we can find the modulus M such that the solution sets are the same. So how do we know that the solution set is empty? Well, for that, we do need the theorem of Weiss. So to prove this corollary, we do need the theorem of Weiss. We, we cannot, cannot make a, a shortcut. So we need to, to uh, use the theorem of Weiss on mass equation. But still, having that, uh, that result, we can prove that uh, there is uh, such a modulus M, such that the solutions of this, that there are no solutions to this congruence modulo M. And I hope I didn't run over time, at least not much. So thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you, Laios, for your nice talk. So maybe now we open for questions to everyone. So I think there is still one question from Ajit Iqbalji. Maybe Ajit Iqbalji, you can speak up and ask the question. Uh, this is on uh, page twenty-six. Page twenty-six. Yes, please. 26. Yes. Uh, where you have M1 uh, divides M and M2 divides M, uh, maybe 25 then. 25? Uh, ah, yes, yes. This one. If uh, M1 and M2 divide M, then this is contained in this. So do you need them co-prime or not? Uh, I think that for this assertion, no. For this assertion, no. Uh, yeah, so you are right in the sense. Just let me add that uh, uh, this is a good strategy to to also previously to to think in a, a co-prime moduli and then uh, com uh, combine them. But in you don't okay. need them. To okay. Thank you. Wonderful talk. Thank you very much. Uh, this is my pleasure. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So there's another. Question from Kisan Poi. So can you, uh, can you unmute and ask yourself? Hello. Am I audible? Yeah, we can hear you. The playback question the equation k equal to three and k equal to four. K equal to four or k equal to five. We can apply the backwards method of linear forms in linear things. I couldn't understand completely. I think that what you what you mean, or I, this is a, as I understood. So you are right. For this equation, you could use the linear forms in logarithms. Completely, completely right. I chose this example only for simple. 
So here I, there are a few terms, and here uh, you can really see very easily what is going on. Small basic terms, so here I could really see what is going on. But for example, if I, if I come here, oops, this equation for here you cannot use linear function of variables. So I don't know any other method than this method I presented based upon Skolheim's conjecture to solve this equation for these values of C. So you take C to be one, how can you solve it? I, I cannot think you can solve it with linear forms in logarithms, or I, at least I don't know how to do that. So uh, you really need this method for it in many cases, but you are right in that example, you really could use linear forms in logarithms. That was only for simplicity. If this was your question. Yeah, so Lyos, just one in the uh, in this application, the first one, uh, like two alpha, two power alpha, three power beta plus five power gamma, this C. Uh, so you use those methods, and I mean, like, is it more of computational or the the first application? The first application. Oh, yeah. sorry. The one which you are showing here, right? So here you mean. Uh, so here we used or method. So or here we. Read the score is messed up, and I can I don't know how to do it other way. Okay. So we, I don't know other method which you could apply here. So here we really went for the modulus. Well, I don't remember the modulus. Well, this modulus is always well. With what I showed you, this this large product, it always works. For also for this case, it worked. I'm I'm sure. I see. But, but for this case, it worked. So, uh, uh, yeah. uh, just a minute regarding the sums of powers of two, I think Hansaraj Gupta has some results too. Uh, I can't check, I can't leave this and cross check with this uh, paper, but I will send you the paper. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. This uh, uh, powers of two and then powers of three. I see, I see. Uh, Hansaraj Gupta, Hansaraj Gupta. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, thank yes. you, thank you. Uh, just a, a remark. So this is really this really is related to an interesting problem, which is really considered by many uh, in many good papers that uh, uh, in basis two a power of three has only a few digits. So such questions really appear uh, in many many points. So thank you very much if you can uh, send me that that paper. So yeah, any more questions? So Lyos, can you please go to the, your um, almost last slide? I mean, the, the last but one slide. Uh, I just go. I, I thank you again very much for you. Yeah, no, 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 no before. <laughs> okay. Okay. So. Oh, yeah, uh, I see. So here, of course, uh, uh, when you said in this modulus, m can be effectively co computed in terms yes. of. Yes. In terms yeah, of A, B, C. Yes. yes. Uh, yeah, so here, so are you, do you use linear forms in addition to from uh, the wild no. no, so here we use the same, same uh, uh, machinery as in the proof for the other, other situation, x to the n minus b times y to the k equals plus minus one, the same machinery. So it's mm -hmm. completely elementary. Orders um, and then congruences and, uh, and the s unit equations. So they ultimately, uh, we just, so with this, with this iterative method, we, we could uh, just uh, obtain an estimate equations, which uh, has just too many solutions. So with this iterative, mm -hmm. you can say that either you are stuck at some point and then you are just done because things become finite and then that's it. Or uh, you can continue it, but at some point then you get just too many solutions to some estimate equations. You know that there are no so many uh, solutions to that estimate equation. That, that, that is the argument, uh, roughly, roughly speaking. But so here, let me emphasize once again that, so in this corollary, it is really very important. So uh, what we can prove is really this. I mean, okay. we can prove that uh, the equation and the congruence, they have the same solution set. That is what we can prove with our method. I see. The step here uh, we need. So here we claim that this congress has no solutions at all. How do we know that? Because we do know that Fermat's equation has no solutions. No, I see. We know it from Weiss. We cannot prove it. We know it from Weiss. Weiss told us that Fermat's equation has no solutions. That's why we can claim that this congruence has no solutions. So it is important that 
it is not that we can make a short, I don't know, some shortcut. No, we do need the very deep theory behind it to, to, to this claim. But still, it's interesting that there is a, this congruence is there. Well, thank you. So are there any more questions or comments? Sorry, one more question. Yeah. Sir, is the converse of this column true? Hello? What? Can you speak louder? I think, uh... Is the converse of this column conjecture true? So as uh, say a few of those columns conjecture, so as far as I know, I don't know any, fur any further result about columns conjecture. So uh, all the results about columns conjecture, well, I just uh, come back to slide. Oops, sorry, this slide. This, this one, sorry. So in the first place, we had a, a result uh, with uh, that I, sh I showed you with Chanad back talk that a Skolem's conjecture is almost always valid. Uh, this, this I don't consider as a as a proof of Skolem's conjecture in some case. Still, it shows that okay, it is not very far from being true. And these are the only cases I am aware of when Skolem's conjecture is proved. So when you have only one term by Schinzel. When the rank is one by uh, Bartolome, Bilu, and Luca, and then these two cases which I presented to you. So now we have say two terms on the left hand side, but still restricted. So you see, if here you replace x to the n by a times x to the n, I don't know how to prove it. If you write on the right hand side a two, I don't know how to prove it. So it's really at the edge, up to my knowledge. So I hope that you can prove it somehow, but up to my knowledge, I, I cannot make it better or this, uh, this uh, Fermat type uh, situation. So when you have three terms, but then you see that the exponents are the same, n, n, n. We can slightly generalize it, but still we need some relation among the exponents. And only three terms here. So I, I don't know any case when you have more terms or, or whatever. So these are all the cases I'm aware of about the proof of Skolem's conjecture. Uh, okay, so some of these results are valid also for algebraic integers, but uh, just the same same equations for algebraic situations. In some cases, they are proved or handled. Okay, so uh, I think if there are no more questions, so we can all unmute ourselves and thank Lyos uh, by clapping once again. So. Please call unmute yourself in this case for Laios. So thank you, Laios, for your time. It was a pleasure.